Hi, uh, my name is Pat Johnstone. I'm from the New West Environmental Partners. I want to say hi to the live streaming audience. Um, we are in the back room of the Heritage Grill, if you're on TV. Uh, we're in downtown New Westminster, and uh, this is we're doing green drinks. Uh, thank you to New TV for uh, live streaming our performance tonight, our show tonight, our talk tonight, whatever we're doing tonight. Um, and actually, we are in the Heritage Grill. So, uh, and just so happens that Sarah, the chef from the Heritage Grill, showed up. So, Sarah, what's, uh, what are the specials tonight? Today we have a fish and chip special, which runs very nicely, and also a pale ale for the drinkers if you like to drink. And you have everybody here um, who's willing to help you guys out with anything, whatever you guys want to do. I cook, they serve, and that's what we do. <laughs> cool, thanks. And there's always live music at the Heritage Grill. What's coming up? Um, today, I actually don't know. Um, I should have checked that. Sorry about okay. that. Yeah, I just don't remember the name of the, but they're really nice. Well, if they're on TV, they can't get here tonight, but they're going to come here yes, this weekend. They'll, What's they'll, be in, they'll be in by um, 8 o'clock tonight, so hopefully in, a, in about an hour or so, in a live show every, every night. Cool. Thanks a lot, and thanks for having us here at the Heritage. Course, please welcome. Anytime. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, I just want to give a shout out to the Heritage because they, uh, they host us here all the time for green drinks. Um, green drinks is a normal, it's, a, it's an international movement. There's people who are doing green drinks around the world. There's uh, uh, 100 countries, several hundred places. It's just a chance for people to get together, have some social drinks, have a bite to eat, and talk about sustainability issues, talk about uh, environment issues, or just talk about anything. Uh, there's not much of a program. It's pretty social. It's pretty easy. Uh, it's, it should be fun. It should be social. It's a chance to meet people. And I'm going to work on my technology here. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I'm Pat Johnson. I'm from the New West Environmental Partners, and the New West Environmental Partners host green drinks in New West and have for a while. Um, our media sponsor, uh, 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 the, the Record. The Record is the newspaper in New Westminster who has been our media sponsor for green drinks this year. They've been giving us free ads. You all are here because you saw the ad in the Record, right? Uh, strung cables all over the place, set up lights, carried heavy things. They did all kinds of stuff to help set up today. Uh, and of course, Carla Olson, who organizes Green Drinks, gets people coming out to Green Drinks, gets our speakers, and does all, kind, all the legwork to make this thing happen. Um, and because of these efforts, we have a really cool speaker today at Green Drinks. Um, we actually have, believe it or not, the Member of Parliament for Burnaby New Westminster and the House Leader for the Official Opposition in Ottawa, t talking to us in the back room of the Heritage Grill tonight. So I'm going to introduce... <laughs> I'm going to introduce Peter Julian. It feels silly for me, who no one knows, to introduce Peter Julian. But uh, in case anyone on TV is just checking in for the first time, we're streaming on live, so you may be in Djibouti right now watching this, and I just want you to know who you're talking to here. Um, Peter was born in New Westminster, raised in Burnaby in New Westminster. Uh, he's been representing the west half of New Westminster in Ottawa for the last decade. Uh, before that, he did all kinds of things that will make New West Environmental Partners types kind of proud. He... Uh, he was uh, part of the Save St. Mary's Coalition. He helped found that. He uh, started an organization supporting small businesses by trying to stop the expansion of big box retailers in New Westminster. He worked for BC Disability Employment Network with the Council of Canadians, with, with a bunch of other organizations. You know, he, a rabble rouser. Before he was an MP, he was a rabble rouser, just getting people interested in sustainability issues and talking about them. So uh, he's also got a reputation right now as one of the hardest working MPs in Ottawa. But he's not here talking about work. He's here talking about a vacation he took in Europe. Isn't that right? Absolutely. So the hardest working MP in Ottawa has come here to talk to you about his vacation and what he saw about renewable and sustainable energy systems when he was on vacation. That's why he's hard working. Okay. So again, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let Peter start talking. Thank you all very much. Uh, here is your member of parliament, Peter Julian. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Pat. Where, this is where I tell jokes. Well, first off, I'd like to say welcome to all my fellow rabble rousers here in New Westminster. <laughs> and uh, secondly, I'll uh, wait uh, for the sign, the heads up, but I just wanted to say uh, a big thank you to our MC, Patrick Johnson. For those of you who haven't been uh, monitoring your, your local websites today, Patrick Johnson announced that he is running for city council in New Westminster this fall, and he is going to be one awesome city councilor in this city. There's no doubt about that. Well, good luck to Patrick. 
And I'd like to thank the New Westminster Environmental Partners. Uh, this is a great group, and this is where things happen. I, I was comparing this uh, with Phil just a few moments ago. This is like uh, some kind of progressive environmentalist speakeasy, where we're in the back of the shop and hidden away from the public. But this is where we get things done, and this is where we move away from the kind of orthodoxy that we're hearing about, particularly from the national government that's in place right now. Things are up. Okay, we're good to go. Well, what we hear about when we open, uh, turn on the television, is that the only way to achieve prosperity in BC and in Canada is through pipelines, right? Northern Gateway, that somehow just building pipelines in every single direction is going to lead to prosperity for Canada. And we know, that we look at Northern Gateway, for example, it's uh, 104 full time on site positions. So, we know the cost to the environment and to the economy, and I'm being told to move this way. I'll be moving back and forth. I tend to move around quite a bit, so this is going to be a bit, uh, bit of a challenge for me. Uh, we've, we've also been told when we look at, and back a little bit too, and I will stand on one leg, and then I will stand on the other leg. Uh, 104 full-time on-site positions for Northern Gateway, threatening thousands of jobs that depend on a clean environment in British Columbia, right? So we're saying no to Northern Gateway. But what are we saying? Yeah, absolutely. But what are we saying yes to? And this is where best practices and great examples worldwide are, are really things that we can take inspiration from here in Canada. So what I'm going to be talking about tonight is my family's vacation. The May, my wife and I uh, saved up our money. And for vacation, we chose to go to, uh, to Germany and to Denmark to see what we can learn as Canadians from the best practices that are in place in, in those two countries. So this is the story of my summer vacation. Now, what we're going to talk about tonight, briefly in the 20 minutes I have, is uh, talk about the island of Samso in Denmark, which is a world leader in clean energy, starting uh, that information starting to come across to North America, but talking even more importantly about clean energy development both in Denmark and Germany. Now, sometimes there's a bit of a, uh, a, a debate around which is the best way to develop clean energy. Some say just look at uh, grassroots development community by community. Others say it takes a national framework. So some people say bottom up, some people say top down. What uh, you'll be able to conclude from uh, the presentation tonight is, in my opinion, it actually takes both. It takes a national framework that is reinforced by strong communities showing real entrepreneurship. And here in New Westminster, we're no stranger to that, of course. In New Westminster, we've got a lot of folks, many of them are here in this room, that work hard to look at sustainability, entrepreneurship, and innovation. Uh, one of them, actually, has just uh, come into the room, and he's running for mayor, Jonathan Cote, and he'll be a hell of a mayor. So, Jonathan, welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. And finally, talk about the Canadian example, which is uh, leadership or a lack of uh, in terms of the federal government, and in certain provinces, some leadership that's being shown. So in, in, in reality, what we're talking about is successes in Denmark and Germany. And I'll, I'll say uh, right off the bat, I think a failure of leadership so far in Canada. So let's start with Samsu. Uh, Samsu is a renewable energy island in the middle of Denmark. You can see where that A is. That's where Samsu is. Uh, right in the midst between eastern Denmark and western Denmark. It's a, an island you can see in the inside square there. Uh, an island that's uh, very long. Uh, in, in the northern part, there's a, you'll see a little green stripe, and a very, it's a very thin part, sort of an isthmus there. That's where the Vikings used to haul their longboats across the peninsula so they could escape their enemies and, uh, and launch raiding parties uh, further on in the western part of that, that sea that's attached to Samsu. It was also a, an island very prominent for uh, Danish kings. You can see it's a northern climate, a Nordic climate, very similar to Canada in very many respects, and largely agricultural, but had some industrial development. And the story of Samsung really starts with the middle 1990s, when a number of the major employers in this island uh, shut their doors. It turned the island into a mini economic depression standpoint, not from the standpoint of prosperity, from the, but the standpoint of, uh, of poverty that the islanders started their journey towards a clean, a clean energy future. 
Now, backing up this, uh, this clean energy uh, approach has been uh, a series of institutions, first started at a grassroots level, and then uh, later on put into effect uh, with uh, the building of the Energy Academy, which is uh, built on a traditional uh, Viking scheme, but uh, in a very innovative way, is a very sustainable building. It's built to maximize both light and uh, natural heating, natural light, natural heating, so very little use of energy. Uh, it's, uh, the Energy Academy's fundamental principle on the island is to ensure, uh, number one, education of the population, particularly young people. The, the time that we were there, uh, young groups, uh, primary school kids, secondary school kids were going in and out constantly. Consultation, and this is the key about uh, the development of clean energy. Consultation is led now through the Energy Academy, before it was done by the activists themselves, but it's designed to make sure that the policies that are put into place for sustainability actually have the support of the public. So consultation is a key part of the orientation in the Energy Academy. And the third is development of public policy. They're constantly mean, uh, looking to evaluate how their policies are, are being carried out, how their clean energy plan is coming into fruition, evaluating, making changes. So it's a constant feedback loop with constant consultation with the community, constant evaluation of public policy. Uh, I'm not sure, is this one working? Yeah. Yep, okay. Constant evaluation of public policy, constant education, particularly of the younger generations. Uh, it is a leader in the renewable energy archipelago, and uh, it receives delegations and visitors from around the world. Uh, Lee May and I were fortunate to be, uh, according to Michael Larson, who's there in the picture, the third and fourth Canadians to visit Samsu. The first is a man named uh, Chris Turner. Uh, has anyone read his book, The Geography of Hope? It came out? Yeah, a few of you have. Yeah, he actually wrote about Samsu in that book. He was the first one to be out there. We were third and fourth. Uh, but it's a real eye-opener when you get there and you see how sustainability and the consultation process is part and parcel of their success. So, SAMHSA's motto is do what you can do and do it now. Think locally and act locally. They started off in this economic depression and the activists got together and said, what can we do to turn things around? This was an island that was entirely dependent on fossil fuels and they decided after many public meetings and discussions that what they wanted to do was work towards building a clean energy ec uh, economy. Now, they started by those consultations in the community and then moved on to consultations with the tradespeople. It says here, a key initial element was the involvement of tradespeople in the development of the clean energy plan that providing the skills so they could achieve this transformation. What Samsu did is following those consultations, they went to the Danish government. And here's where public policy on a national level can have such an impact. The Danish government agreed to provide training and support so the tradespeople, now unemployed because of the closure of all the major employers on the island, could then transition into clean energy trades. So there was direct involvement of the central government in providing the education and training that allowed them to start that uh, long trek towards the clean energy future. Now, the other key element was the investment of the islanders themselves. This wasn't with outside investment. It was almost entirely funded by the islanders themselves, uh, taking uh, whatever it was, uh, final payments they got from the closure of the business, uh, uh, whatever uh, accumulated funds they'd had from their farming agricultural operations, even borrowing money from folks off island. The islanders themselves decided, with this training, we're going to start investing and building clean energy economy. And they started by building an onshore wind farm, uh, five megawatts, uh, an initial start to see how things would work. And they, they had a lot of trials and tribulations, but they succeeded in building it. And they really haven't looked back since. So. They then moved from there to greater and more ambitious projects. And in 2002, Samsu, this, this island that had uh, been impoverished a decade before, built what was then the largest offshore wind farm in the world, 23 megawatt capacity. It comes in as you take the ferry from the Danish uh, mainland, uh, you come right into, it's, it's absolutely staggering, the size and scope of this offshore wind farm that was built 
with the Islanders' money themselves and the profits from the onshore wind farm that they built before. Now, they built that as part of their steps to take to build the clean energy economy from the electricity standpoint. But they also had put into place through consultation a three-step plan that we'll talk about in a moment. First step, of course, was electricity. They succeeded with the onshore and offshore wind farms and the development of a grid of solar power as well and building a strong focus on energy efficiency which uh, we'll come back to in terms of the Canadian example. They put the emphasis on energy efficiency in terms of the island itself, which allowed them to build uh, export capacity. And now 140% of their electricity comes from harnessing wind power. They export the surplus to the mainland. And the householders themselves, the citizens of Samsu, are the ones that benefit from this export trade. So you've got a, a very key, very targeted, electricity development, building of uh, clean energy that has allowed the, the island to benefit from that export and move on to the second stage. And the second stage was heating. So now all the electricity is provided for, Andrew? Provided for by, by the uh, renewable energy. They wanted to move on and transform the second component of that. Uh, they had diesel fuel heating. They decided to move to, to biomass uh, as their district heating plants and build four of them in various parts of the island. Now they use wood and they use straw. This is the northern Samsu uh, biomass uh, district heating plant. Now what they have as a backup is a solar energy plant right next door. So you can see uh, the uh, water tank on the right and where our car was, the solar field in the distance, the solar field is their plan B. Now, once they built these district heating plants, they saw two problems. One of it was actually keeping the solar field because it was on uh, vacant land, keeping it from being covered over with, uh, as the grass grew. So that was one problem. The other problem was with biomass, uh, particularly in the straw district heating plants, they were having lots of problems with rodents. So in typical Danish style, they decided low tech solutions. We're gonna get some full-time volunteers, both to keep the grass down so that the solar energy can be accessed and to keep the rodents away. And this uh, volunteer team on the left, <laughs> a herd of goats they put on, the goats make sure that that grass is kept down so the solar panels are never blocked. And they have a, a SWAT team of cats that are there in the straw plants, straw district heating plants, and they make sure that uh, the rodents don't get out of control. Now in the past, the farmers used to burn the straw in the fields. One farmer said to me, you know, 30 years ago, we just burnt it. Now we sell it to the district heating plant, another source of prosperity. These are local source biomass. So what we're seeing is instead of the waste that they had before, uh, farmers and homeowners actually benefiting from the biomass plants that then heat the entire area around, uh, around the island. Now 90% of those... Uh, of the heating on the island is supplied through biomass and clean energy projects. So those products make a real difference. So step one, electricity. They've now moved to export, they meet all the needs of the island and export the, uh, the surplus to the mainland. Step two, heating plants are at 90%, will be at 100% within the course of the next uh, year or so. They're now tackling the third and final stage of their transformation to a complete elimination of fossil fuels and a complete clean energy economy, and that is transportation. Now, they now have about 2% of the local car fleet with electric vehicles, but that is growing. Uh, and I understand uh, from uh, some emails with Michael that that's doubled uh, even since I, I did this presentation a few months ago. So uh, they are m looking to meet those targets in the same way they met the targets for heating and for electricity. That major shift towards electric cars has as a ironclad objective 50% of vehicles powered by electricity in 2021, the next seven years, and they will meet that objective as they met, has met all the others, and 100% by 2030, 100% of their fleet. They will have eliminated uh, for land transportation any use of fossil fuels, and they're looking to convert the offshore ferry fleet as well to biofuels. So what, we're see, what we will see in Samsu is the complete elimination of fossil fuels. This is 
uh, fundamental leadership that we are not just seeing in Samsu, but in other regions of Denmark as well. There are 98 municipalities throughout, throughout Denmark. Many of them are close behind Samsu. Samsu's the leader, but the island of Aero, uh, A-E-R-O, which is um, about 150 kilometers south, is speedily catching up. And there's this uh, very healthy rivalry between the two to see who can be the first to be fossil fuel fuel free and who can be the first to be a complete clean energy economy. The biosphere at the Samsu Energy Academy that you see on the right is really the symbol for this. Uh, the feeling is acting locally but ensuring that we have a sustainable world and a sustainable planet. So if Samsu has succeeded in doing this, what is the input from the national level? And this is where you see the energy policy milestone set by the Danish government. Again, in consultation with those 98 municipalities across, uh, across the nation, but also in consultation with the public, is a key component of why Samsu is pushing towards uh, clean energy. And what the government has put into place is ironclad milestones in the same way that the island has and the same way other municipalities have. The, the national government has put into place clear milestones. So by 2020, half of the traditional consumption of electricity covered by wood, wood, wind power. 2030, coal is phased out. 2035, electricity and heat supply covered by renewable energy. 2050, all energy supply, electricity, heat, energy and transport is covered by renewable energy. Samsu is just 20 years bef uh, really ahead of what the national plan is. But they're both going to the same game plan. They're both working ahead. Uh, some regions, Aero, Samsu, are way ahead of the national government. But the national government is pushing the entire country along to make sure that ultimately uh, the energy strategy 2050 is achieved. The initiatives up to 2020 will result in greenhouse gas reduction by 35% in relation to 1990. All of this has been a subject of a very inclusive and open debate and its adoption of consensus-based policy with well-resourced institutions and clearly defined responsibilities. The Energy Academy in Samsu is replicated by other similar uh, organizations or associations or institutions throughout Denmark, they are all working to the national plan. That is what is exciting about what is happening in Denmark. Now, there are challenges, of course, given the fact that there is uh, uh, variations in terms of supply. Uh, sometimes there's undercapacity, sometimes overcapacity in terms of, of, of oversupply, in terms of uh, the wind power. And that is something that they are uh, attempting to, to meet through integrated planning of a smart grid system uh, with the electricity, heat, and transmission, allowing uh, then for the wind power particularly, the, allowing the grid to adapt to that changing production. Now, Denmark is part of the Nordic grid system, which also includes Norway and Sweden, and uh, increasingly northern Germany. So what we're seeing is uh, smart grid planning and investments that are taking place that will have an impact in uh, much of Scandinavia and part of Northern Europe. Uh, they are also looking, and we get back to that initial stage when they talk to tradespeople and put into place uh, that training plan for the tradespeople, that they are looking to continue to have access to highly qualified labor. This is a key component, and this is where Canada will need to go as well. Uh, clean energy is tech technological uh, innovation. What that means is you have to make sure that the workforce is kept up to date as those innovations occur. In Denmark, they've learned that, and that's a key part of their success. So Denmark has been a major exporter of cl new clean technologies. They're now a leading player in wind turbine production. They supply one third of the global wind turbine based electricity market. And energy technologies and equipment account for approximately 10% of Danish goods exports. So you simply cannot say that there is, has to be a choice between the economy or the environment. What they've done in Denmark is prove the contrary, that a healthy economy really depends on a healthy environment. And they have, in a very clear way, I think, sent a message to the rest of the world. Now, I'd like to move on to Germany. Uh, anyone here applaud Germany when they won the World Cup? Yeah. Yep. Well, <laughs> okay. 
I was cheering for Germany too. There's three of us. Okay. I, everybody else was cheering for Argentina? Okay. Some people weren't cheering at all. Okay. That's fine. Uh, there's another reason to applaud Germany, and that is uh, best practices that German policy has put into place. And the second part of the presentation is really on German policy doing the same thing in a slightly different way than what uh, Denmark has done. What German policy has been is to uh, put into place an energy efficient and environmental friendly economy, maintaining affordable energy policies and a high level of economic prosperity. Uh, there again, the whole issue of energy efficiency was one of the key components initially. A lot of consultation on the German model as well. And what has, that has resulted in is federal laws that give clean energy priority over fossil fuels in the transmission grid. They also have commitment to programs in energy-related research, development, and deployment. And we'll compare that to Canada in just a moment. But encouraging the private sector to increase spending on research and development and deployment has been a key part of their success. And of course, the German model has been followed now by more than 40, I think it's close to 50 governments around the globe. Uh, they have put into place a number of policy innovations, including the first to introduce feed-in tariffs and right to connect as part of their overall energy policy mix. Here again, as with Denmark, what they've got is very, very clear targets. This is not something that's on the back of a napkin. It's done through clear consultation, and then there is a drive in the society, among the citizens, among uh, government institutions, and uh, uh, parliamentary institutions to ensure that those objectives are met. In Denmark, they've succeeded. In Germany, uh, they are doing very well towards succeeding those goals too. Uh, they do have some challenges that we'll come to in a moment. So GHD reduction, 40% below 1990 levels by 2020, 55% by 2030, 70% by 2040, 80 to 95 percent of greenhouse gas reduction by 2050. Energy efficiency, key component, 20 percent reduction in primary energy consumption by 2020, 50 percent by 2050 compared to 2008. Ambitious but achievable. Renewable electricity, 35 percent of total production by 2020, 50 percent 2030, 65 percent 2040, 80% by 2050, and this is enshrined in the Renewable Energy Sources Act, enshrined in legislation. So what have they achieved so far? Well, they've achieved uh, employment that now exceeds employment in the auto industry, which is one of the most important industries in Germany. Almost 380,000 jobs in the renewable energy e e sectors, and that's expected to grow over the next six years to over half a million jobs. That is phenomenal in terms of the increase in jobs in renewable energy, uh, showing real prosperity. Now, what they've done with wind is built that up, and wind is now the second largest consumer of steel after the auto industry, uh, over 100,000 jobs in the wind industry. And when you look at solar, photovoltaic, uh, Germany did spend about $10 billion on solar subsidies, uh, but they've created over 111,000 jobs in that sector. And just to do a little bit of a contrast for those who have been critical, uh, particularly lobbyists for the oil industry, they've been critical, $10 billion spent on solar subsidies. Uh, you may have seen the IMF uh, report that came out a few weeks ago that indicated that Canada's subsidy, the fossil fuel sector, including uh, the fact that we uh, are not providing uh, any sort of incentive to diminish auto uh, air pollution or greenhouse gas emissions, uh, according to the IMF, our subsidies to the fossil fuel sector amount to $34 billion annually. So to create over 111,000 jobs for subsidies of $10 billion to get the program started in renewable energy, I, I think uh, actually shows a prudent investment that has created real meaningful employment in the long term. For job creation, you can see in each sector uh, there has been growth, uh, wind, uh, there was a slight downturn from 2009 to 2010 because the initial construction had been completed, but you can see the number of direct and indirect jobs climbing, and that is something that has continued in Germany to this day. Uh, as you go through Germany, particularly Brandenburg, which was the uh, state uh, in eastern Germany that we visited, this was one of the transition uh, states formerly part of East Germany, a lot of uh, very polluting old coal plants from the Soviet era now being transformed by investments. 
uh, for those of you who've been in East Germany, you can see there's still many traces of, uh, of the Soviet era and uh, a, a lot of reconstruction that needs to be undergone. Uh, what the German government and the state governments have done have really tried to prioritize solar power throughout the country, and you see it on many, many homes. You can also see wind turbines. Uh, this is a coal plant that I'll come back to in a moment, but it, around the coal plant, if you just look uh, below, below the shaft that is there, you can actually see, and it was, it was fascinating going up, great a metaphor, at the top of the coal plant, you could actually see ringing around the renewable energy, uh, wind turbines in every direction. And uh, as uh, well, you can see us uh, here in the center of the, the coal plant. This is one of the new um, high efficiency coal plants that are there. Uh, this is uh, part of the German challenge that I'd like to speak to you for a moment on. Uh, but what they have done is built coal plants that are high efficiency, that are, are uh, obviously better than the coal plants that existed in the Soviet era. Now, why are they doing that if their drive is for clean energy? Here is uh, the, the paradox and the challenge in Germany. They're trying to do two things at once. One is a major shift towards clean energy. The other is following the Fukushima disaster where the German government decided to shut down the last nine of the 17 nuclear reactors that existed in Germany by 2022. So what Germany is attempting to do is unparalleled in terms of the challenges. They're making the transition to clean energy, uh, showing leadership worldwide, at the same time as they're completely phasing out their nuclear program. And what that has led to is the following. Some people have criticized Germany for, for stalling a little bit in terms of, of the rapid climb in, in clean energy development. What's actually happening is this. The older coal plants are being phased out and being replaced by clean energy, which is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But at the same time as that is happening, uh, they are closing down the nuclear plants, so one a year roughly. And at the same time, they are bringing on stream the high efficiency coal and gas plants to replace the nuclear power. In that case, what's happening is the greenhouse gas emissions are going up. So this is a, a temporary, uh, but uh, nonetheless, real challenge that Germany is facing, trying to do two things at once. Uh, what they have succeeded in doing is phasing out the old coal plants. They will now have to, once they finalize phasing out the nuclear reactors, they will have to then phase out the new, uh, the new coal plants that are high efficiency and have fewer emissions. What they've also done is put in place a regulatory framework for carbon storage uh, the problem is the market is still very rudimentary, so that continues to cause some problems. So coal remains a feature of Germany's energy mix so they can phase out nuclear power for the moment. Carbon capture storage facility, you see that on the right. I'm there in the hard hat, and uh, uh, right behind us is the, uh, one of their pilot uh, storage facilities. Uh, they've gotten the technology down pat. They don't have the public policy in place yet to actually ensure that there's a market uh, for the carbon that they've captured. So that continues to be a public policy challenge. So they have ongoing ambitious uh, goals that require uh, adjustments. As with the Danish model, they're continually reacting, consulting, and ensuring, they're updating. They have a new version of their uh, Renewable Energy Act that's actually coming on stream as of August 1st, so they're continuing to make adjustments. Uh, they're having to look at uh, uh, re rebuilding or building uh, with new technology, smart grids, uh, new power lines. That's a 30 to $40 billion investment. Canada faces the same challenges over the next couple of decades. And there is uh, continued issues around the clean energy transition burden. Uh, what they've put in place is a renewable energy surcharge that has been rising, and what uh, for low-income housing, uh, low-income households, that's can started to be a real challenge. So, what uh, the government has done, again in this version that's introduced on August 1st, is uh, they are putting more of the, uh, the the burden or the pressure on industry. So, industry will be picking up uh, more of the tab for the renewable energy surcharge. They've been exempt, uh, many of them, prior to uh, August 1st and households as a result will see uh, a little bit of an alleviation of the cost of the renewable energy surcharge. So in Germany, in short, real benefits, real job creation, hundreds of thousands of jobs created. They continue to meet the objectives set 
in terms of renewable energy. At the same time, they're trying to phase out nuclear power, which has led to new challenges uh, that their policy changes are looking to adapt to. Finally, Canada. Now, in Canada, you're not going to see the same type of renewable energy examples put into place, but if you look across the country, the blue dots are uh, hydroelectric plants, which are renewable energy, as we know, that come at a, a real environmental cost. And the yellow dots are wind farms that are starting to uh, be put into place in certain parts of the country. For most of the rest of the country, when you look at what the sources of energy are, it's oil, natural gas, uh, diesel fuel, uh, nuclear. And so this is the challenge that we face as a country. What is Canada's ranking in the world? Well, when you look at the top 10 in renewable energy capacity of the uh, major industrialized countries, Canada is not even in the top 10, um, uh, is barely in the top 20. And emerging economies such as China, India, and Brazil are all ahead of Canada in terms of their clean energy capacity. You can see Germany uh, shooting up now just behind the, the two major countries, United States and China, both of whom have made major investments in clean energy. In research and development, Canada lags in a whole range of areas around business R&D expenditure, but also public R&D expenditure. In terms of industrialized countries, Canada is last among industrialized countries for public investment in R&D. Energy development uh, for clean energy, last among industrialized countries, last in terms of patent development, second to last in terms of the number of doctorates that are produced. So we need to have a, a major shift with the federal government to actually look at how clean energy has succeeded in other countries and ensure that we're putting in the R&D expenditure that is needed. But the potential is vast, a trillion dollar market worldwide right now. And over the next six to seven years, that is going to triple. We're talking about the creation of millions of millions of new jobs worldwide in clean energy, in the United States, in China, in Germany, in Denmark, throughout the world. Unless Canada starts to make those investments, we are not going to benefit from what is a clean energy boom taking place worldwide. And the round table on the economy and the environment projected 400,000 direct jobs in Canada with the right policies in clean energy. That's not even including the indirect jobs, which are normally a factor of two, uh, 2.5 for every direct job, which would mean, of course, a million new jobs in Canada with the right investment policies. There are some provinces that are doing some interesting things. Uh, Prince Edward Island has an energy savings bond program. Uh, Nova Scotia, the former Nova Scotian government, had put into place pilot projects for tidal power, which were exciting and, uh, and world-leading. In Manitoba, there is a, a real attempt to build on geothermal, and uh, that has been uh, North American leading, certainly. But for the most part, provincial governments are looking for the federal government to show some leadership. And then there is the issue of energy efficiency. Uh, now, we mentioned that because both in Denmark and Germany, this has been a key part of their success. Well, in 2007, the Council of Energy Ministers set a target of retrofitting every home in Canada by 2030. In, set in place was the Eco Energy Retrofit Homes Program, which had unprecedented pickup from the Canadian public. Thousands, thousands of households applied. Uh, so much so, it was so successful, that the federal government killed the program. Now, what the result is, is that we have now 8% of homes have had a retrofit. Uh, many buildings operate at 50% below their efficiency potential. And Canada's energy efficiency among the major economies has been rated second to last. Again, we are trailing the rest of the world. So, things have to happen in Canada. To determine and to look at a prosperous future then, we have to look at what has worked in other countries. You look at the Danish model and the German model, it has been a consultation loop, a putting, putting into place after that consultation, very clear targets, and then having a rigorous and very disciplined adherence to make sure those objectives, those targets become reality. We see with an island like Samsu, what they have been able to achieve with their own resources, with their own determination, with their own little financial resources and a, and a really determined attitude to bring about a change, 
SAMSU is showing the world that you can move from fossil fuels and move to a clean energy economy that actually puts in place prosperity for everybody. That's the kind of example I think we need to see in Canada. We need to make sure we have a, a national government that is actually ensuring that the policies are in place so that communities across this country, like New Westminster, can take up the challenge and each one of us, each community across the country, can contribute in their own way to our national objectives. You've seen now how SAMSU did it. You see how Germany's doing it. Now it's time for Canada to do it. Thanks very much for listening. I look forward to our, our discussion. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I wanted to actually run around and get people. If people have questions, we'll do a little bit of a Q&A session here. If you want to do a Q&A while we're still on TV and stuff and ask a couple of quick questions, I will try to run around. And if the microphone works, it work. It does work. Cool. Well, uh, so please ask questions. I'll run around. And by the way, uh, when you were talking about Germany and Argentina, I couldn't help but look behind you. The Brazilian flag is Yes, yes. <laughs> Poor Brazil. Anyone? Biofuel or biomass, were they bring the garbage away into that, that burn room to generate electricity? You didn't talk about uh, so in talk some about garbage yeah, the question is, uh, what, did they yeah. use garbage or were they using waste and waste for their waste energies besides the biomass? Besides wood and straw. Uh, they, they do uh, some uh, triage to take out the uh, wood and straw, but basically, no, the garbage is treated in another, in another, another area. Uh, but that, that's they, uh, they've managed to el eliminate largely be because of recycling uh, a lot of the, the, the garbage that uh, existed 30 years ago. So they've made real progress there too. Okay. Um, thinking back to the slides you showed us uh, in Brandenburg with all the solar panels on the roofs and also with the idea of thinking locally and acting locally, it may not be a question you can answer, but maybe Mr. Cote could. Um, Currently, what are sort of bylaws and concerns um, about putting solar panels on roofs in New Westminster? And with our rather unique sort of we pay the city for electricity, how can that maybe feed into the grid or how could that work? Is that being addressed? Actually, could, Jonathan, do you mind coming up? Since you're in campaign anyhow, you might as well. <laughs> Well, I, I think the city of New Westminster, particularly in that we have our own utility, has a lot of opportunities that I, I don't think we've really fully taken advantage of in the past. Uh, in terms of solar, uh, hooking up solar panel uh, units to, to houses, uh, the city does have a program that's actually worked at connecting those to hot water heaters where there has been a, you know, a bigger payback and there has been some uptake on residents, not, not a lot. Um, but having said that, I think there are, are opportunities to, to look at that and the fact that the city has its own utility, I think, really would actually make it easier for New Westminster, even as opposed to many of our other municipal neighbours, to, to look into something like that. Thanks, Jonathan. Oh, you <laughs> you give back the microphone. Thanks. Okay, I got a question for you. One big challenge in Canada that always seems to get sort of ignored is the idea of industrial um, sort of transportation when it comes to trains and trucks and getting things across our big country. Have they looked into any of that type of thing for how that could be turned into an alternative? That, that's a, it's a very good, very good question. And uh, in, in Denmark, in Germany, tra being, transportation being one of the sectors that have been identified, they are now tackling that now. Uh, obviously, they don't have the long, distance, uh, long distances that we have in Canada. But I've no doubt, if uh, we're looking over the next few years, we look at SAMSU and their conversion to total elimination of transportation with fossil fuels, uh, we're going to see some solutions coming out of, of their initiatives in the same way Germany uh, is providing initiatives. Uh, right now, they're for short haul. And so they're, they're moving to electric vehicles, hybrids. Uh, they're moving to a variety of vehicles which reduce emissions. Uh, but that tends to be short haul. Uh, we need some long haul solutions. And Canada would be a, could be a terrific leader worldwide if we were doing the research and development. Uh, I'll give you just, uh, just one example. There's a, there's a company in Saskatoon that is looking into solar energy storage. They've had interests from around the world, from China, from the United States, all wanting to 
to buy into their pilot program. And they've said, no, uh, we don't want to have uh, uh, another country developing this new technology. We want to do it in Canada. And yet they have been unable to get the federal government to provide the funding for them to set up their, their first pilot project that will actually prove the viability of their idea for solar storage. So uh, this, is, this is something that is immensely frustrating to folks who are looking to pioneer, like long-haul trucking, uh, like a whole variety of, of other innovations and, and options, federal government's simply not there, and that has to change. So thank you. This is, this is one of the areas where we should be innovating, and that's one of the areas where we should be showing leadership. Okay, one more question. Thank you. Um, I think in your slides, uh, you mentioned that uh, most of the energy surcharge in Germany is coming from households. Yeah and not the major energy users. And I'm just wondering if they explained why. Uh, well, this is one of the things that they've changed, right? So the renewable energy surcharge has been rising. Uh, for lower income households, this has been a, a, uh, a problem that has uh, become more and more acute. And so because there's that consultation and feedback loop, the, the German government, German parliamentarians are aware of this. And they've, done, they've taken measures to provide uh, some support for those lower-income households on the one hand. And the other thing they've done uh, with the, uh, the changed or modified uh, renewable energy plan that takes, uh, takes effect August 1st is they have shifted a lot of the load to industry. Industry was exempt. And so this is why they've been continually, and this is why the feedback and consultation is so important. They've been continually evaluating, is this working, is this working? And they found that the way the renewable energy surcharge was put into place was hurting low-income households and industry wasn't carrying its fair share. So they've made that shift, uh, not, not with unanimity from industry. Some of the industrialists said, well, no, we shouldn't be paying for this. Um, but they've all accepted that it is doable, and that's why it takes effect August 1st. And, and this, with any energy plan that uh, is put into place uh, for, for clean energy in Canada, we're going to have to make sure there's a continual feedback loop because there will be uh, issues that develop along the way. There needs to be modifications. Uh, what I think is clearest from the German and Dan Danish model is that that's got to be part and parcel. Clean energy comes with clean consultation, and you've got to make sure that the two work together to achieve your objectives and put in place a successful plan. Okay, I, I lied. One more question, just because the, uh, one of the founders of the NWEP asked me for a question, so I have to give him, I have to give him the floor. Peter, yeah. Uh, Germany. Um, whenever I read about uh, clean coal and, and carbon capture in North America, it, uh, it's, it's still not there. So what are they doing in those two areas? Where are they storing that carbon? Uh, and clean coal, uh, shutting down nuclear with zero emissions, going to clean coal, uh, which it definitely is going to have some emissions. So can you shed some more light on that one? Well, that's the real challenge, and that's why uh, you'll, you'll see some people being very critical that the German model isn't working. Uh, I would argue that the German model is very much working, but they are doing too much. Um, and what, what has happened then is, is the emissions are increasing as nuclear is phased out and clean coal is phased in even though emissions are falling as the old dirty coal plants are phased out and clean energy is phased in. So because they're doing two things at once, the, um, the emissions have, uh, have not gone down. Uh, and in fact, in some months have actually increased. And some have pointed to that as showing that the, the German plan doesn't, doesn't work. It's not true. Um, but they are doing uh, a lot in one decade, more than any other country has uh, attempted to do. And so what I think we will see is as they have phased out nuclear, um, they then have, will have phased out the old, the old coal plants as well. Then they can move to phase out the new coal plants. And, and hopefully with cap, ca carbon capture, they will be able to develop the market so that that is actually a viable part of the... Uh, the new high efficiency coal plants uh, uh, plan. But regardless, over the next decade, uh, we will see a sharp drop in German em emissions because nuclear will have been phased out and the old coal plants will be phased out. It's not from a year to year standpoint, it's the overall 
uh, contribution over 10 years where, where we'll, we'll see the most marked evidence of success in the German model, I think. Okay, thank you. Can I uh, ever please thank Peter Julian for giving us that presentation. It's nice to hear a positive vision for the future and a positive vision for the economy. Um, uh, the conversation, this is Green Drinks, so the conversation doesn't end now. The conversation just begins now. Uh, we can all sit down, have a drink, relax, and, uh, and have a good conversation about what we've heard or about anything else you guys want to talk about. Live stream people, the conversation ends now for you because you didn't come down. So uh, I got to sign off to you guys. Um, I want to thank, before I do sign off, uh, Peter Julian, of course. One more applause. One more. One more. And thanks to the folks at home watching on New West TV. New West TV is just an awesome group of people that uh, help bring uh, all the important events in New Westminster to people's homes. So thank you very much, New West TV. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you to the record. Thank you to the Heritage Grill. Oh, I checked, by the way, the Angie Faith Band is going to start playing out front in about 10 minutes. And this weekend, Mojo, Mojo All-Stars are playing Friday night. They're going to play you some blues rock. And then the Saturday, Wendy Biscuit and her Dirty Swing Band. That just sounds like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> so uh, that's the Heritage Grill down here in downtown New West. If you're coming from anywhere else, um, I'm going to sign off the live stream right now. And everybody else, please have fun, have a drink, and thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.